because you only get one chance to lose people's money, right? And you'll never get that chance. And Again, not a financial advice, but we shouldn't throw the baby out with the dirty bathwater. No, so it's a deep rabbit hole. It's a very deep rabbit hole, absolutely. In ancient times, things were more decentralized, city-states and these types of things, right? It's this, and it's that, and it's that, and it's this, and it's a little bit of everything. Your stable coins, your lending platforms, your DEXs, all street, you know? Wall Street, Main Street, you need both. Mine was Cindy Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> Most blockchains and projects in the crypto space seem to think it's a good idea to move fast and break things. That's the opposite approach of Cardano. I spoke with Jerry from IOHK about their academic, slow-moving, long game that they are playing to build what they believe will be the dominant blockchain of the future. That's dope. One of the founding principles of IOHK is cascading disruption. That's right. Yeah. I love that term. Yes. What does it mean? So, I mean, you got to think about when you're building a blockchain, you always have to start with solid foundations. So where do you start from? You start with vision and mission and strategy, right? So cascading disruption is really about what is it that blockchain was built for? It's built for empowering individuals, right? So for centuries, probably post-industrial revolution, I would say, things have gotten very centralized. Centralized corporations, centralized government, probably start with Napoleon, right? And there's like a, a historical context to this, right? Um, in ancient times, things were more decentralized, city-states and these types of things, right? Um, and there's this kind of desire, I would say, uh, from humanity, especially in the Western democracies of the world, to change the order of things, to bring power back to the individual. So that's what I, I view as disruption. But as one company or as one individual, you can't do it by yourself. So the way I think of a cascading is about using the power of the network effect, building an ecosystem, decentralizing that, empowering people, and then it creates a cascade of, of disruption. Anything's better than cascading liquidations. That's right. <laughs> so I'll take cascading disruption as, right. as our new term I, in, the, in the crypto space for, I'd, I'd for love to cascades. Touch, I'd love to touch on the cascading liquidations, but maybe I can kind of take a step back Please and do. talk about like the ethos of what Input Output is, what Cardano is and so forth. Please. So Input Output is a technology company and it's a very vision and mission oriented company. Um, and it's built on a foundation of provably secure blockchains. So starting from first principles in the science lab, right, with researchers and proving out what a secure, decentralized, scalable interoperable blockchain could look like, and then slowly bringing this into the world very methodically. So it starts in the research lab. Um, it's, you know, it started with, uh, you know, working with the University of Edinburgh. We've expanded that remit to a lot of universities around the world. I think we're at 10 or 20 universities. Recently, we gave a donation to uh, Stanford, $4.5 million, adding on top of our $500,000 donation a while back to foster that innovation and that research. So really scientifically proven, peer reviewed. That's where it starts from. And then we extend that into the technology. So it needs to use formal methods. This is why we use Haskell as a, as a programming language. That's a functional programming language. So you can start with something that's scientifically proven to something that's executed most faithfully to that scientific proof. So that's really the basis of how we do that. That's our ethos. So we start with the mission and vision but we're changing the world, so it has to be provably secure. That is the base layer of how this is gonna work, right? And then we need to make sure it's decentralized because how can you empower individuals if it's centralized? And then we can get the scalability performance that get, you get the user experience and so forth, and then you can get the interoperability where we play nicely with other blockchains. So we do this very methodically. We use the term measure twice, cut once. That's our, that's our methodology, which creates a lot of you know, uh, pushback from I'm, I'm the chief commercial officer, so I feel this every day, right? Yeah, everybody likes to move fast and break things. That's right. That is not our philosophy. We've broken a lot of things. We have. We have. If you've been following me for the last few months, then you definitely know that I've been trading and investing on BitGet. 
Now listen, it took me six months to decide that they were going to be the sponsor for the newsletter. But once I saw their partnership with Juventus, that they were the world's leading copy trading platform in crypto, and also that they're a top five exchange by volume, well, I was sold and I was convinced. And I've been using it ever since to dollar cost average and to invest in Bitcoin. You can also trade there with leverage, but of course, be careful if you're gonna do that. And I don't know if you saw the recent news, but they've also done a deal with Lionel Messi. Now you can get up to an $8,000 bonus using my link below and you can trade spot with absolutely no fees. You also get a 15% discount on trading leverage. Go ahead and sign up right now using the wolf of all streets dot info slash bitget. Claim that huge reward and use the world's best trading platform. Ultimately, the value of the blockchains and where they're going to end up is still happening. We haven't gotten there yet. So, you know, the first wave where the ICO waves are kind of figuring out how you can raise money for companies. We, we all saw how that went. Uh, the next wave was DeFi and NFTs. And that's the, that's the go fast and break things. Ultimately, and this is my role as chief commercial is, well, where's the real use and utility of the blockchain? And for me, that's where you bridge it to the real world. This is why we spend so much time in Africa and emerging markets. It's about bringing uh, financial inclusion, economic identity to those who don't have it, right? And so that's where it comes to. Now, in the meanwhile, it's a bit like you, you, your, your name, you know, the Wolf of Wall Street. It's, that's Main Street and Wall Street, right? That's the idea. So NFTs and DeFi for me is Wall Street. You need that. You need the innovation. You need the liquidity. You need the traders getting in there, doing the crazy things that they do. And of course, it's going to break things. And of course, there are going to be liquidations. But hopefully, people who get into that space know what they're getting into, and they know that's what it is. But that's not where the true utility is going to come from. That's going to create the primitives that you need for the true utility. Your stable coins, your lending platforms, your DEXs, et cetera, et cetera. They'll go through these cycles and you'll create this infrastructure that could then be directed towards the real economy. And that's where I see things going for the industry. And frankly, that's the way that we see things for us, right? So we're in a price discovery phase now. The macroeconomic environment is infecting a lot of what's going on because of liquidity and all. You know, it's hard to say this for those people who have put their money, and this is not financial advice, of course, put their money in, in the industry and then lost their money, is that, you know, this is the innovation phase of it. And later we'll get to the real utility where that money could be used towards real world use cases and you could tie it to real world e economics. Um, and I think that's ultimately where it'll end up going and where exactly how that's going to work out. It's anybody's guess. We made our bets towards financial inclusion, you know, uh, micro lending and remittances in these types of markets in the emerging world. That's our bet. But it's a general purpose platform. So we have an ecosystem building around trying all kinds of different things. And, you know, it's it's an evolutionary pressure. At one point, there'll be things that succeed, things that fail, and then it'll find its, its, its utility. I mean, it sounds like you guys have somewhat opted out of the move fast and break things. You have a very academic approach yes. and you're playing the long game for that's utility. Exa that's exactly right. That's the best way to describe it. Absolutely. But we still, of course, back to the Main Street, Wall Street thing, you still need some of that, right? You still need that experimentation because that's what's going to provide the liquidity to the marketplace that can then be directed to the right. But market. you need that experimentation on, on Cardano or can you watch everybody else blow things up? You're right. We, I'm we, asking. I don't know. We watch what's going on very carefully. We sat at a round table, a consensus with the DeFi players, and they were very demanding of what they needed, right? They said, we need a stable coin. We need a multi-chain bridge. We need EVM compatibility. We need more developer experience. They were very clear about these things. And I was sitting down with Charles, and Charles took a very, you know, he told, listen, of course you need these things. But look what's happening in the marketplace. Look what's happening with the bridges, for example. Oh my God. Right? That's a vector of attack. And you've got to be very careful about doing that because you only get one chance to lose people's money, right? And you'll never get that chance and again. And man, are we taking those opportunities everywhere right, we can exactly. find them. Right? So, you know, we, of course we feel that pressure. We do look at what our competitors are doing very carefully to make sure we don't repeat the same. So we do borrow from their innovation as well. But they also borrow from our innovation. So. On the research side, you know, let's get proof of stake done properly. I think we've established that on Cardano based on the Ouroboros protocol. And that protocol is open source, open to the public, and Polkadot used that protocol. So the innovation goes both ways. But we are definitely the long game, you know, measure twice, cut once. That's what we're about. So the ecosystem partners that are bought into that vision and mission, 
that we work very well together. Those that are looking to make a quick buck or, you know, imitate everybody else, that's probably not the best place for you. Does that make it difficult? I mean, your job literally is to go out and speak with these people and make it happen. Does it, do you find that there's people who just get it and say, yes, we're in for the long game? Or do you find it's very difficult because everybody wants it's, it's their cake and to eat it too, yeah. and they want to be rich next year and they want to see a 10 year process, com, you know, compacted into six months. Yeah. So uh, it's extremely difficult from a commercial perspective because we feel all of it, right? And, you know, making sure that our relationship with everybody is a positive relationship is part of what, I'm, what I do, right? But it's hard sometimes because there are people that want things done quickly and you got to tell them you got to wait and that creates a gap of expectation. And then they'll go on Twitter and they'll complain and they'll create the FUD and so forth. Whereas there is a subset that are very much in line with the long game, right? So like governments tend to be more longer term oriented. Research institutions and universities understand that long game. So there is a, a certain cultural fit that needs to work itself out. And I would say it's, it's a subset, it's not the majority. So, you know, we're very careful about the partners that we work with, that they're bought into this. So for example, WMC that are here with us today, they're about connecting the unconnected in the emerging markets. They're very much bought into this. They're on a vision, you know, five, 10 year vision and mission, right? So those type of partnerships work quite well. We're very jealous about the type of partnerships we create based on these types of things. We have a partner like Singularity, um, they're uh, ben, Dr. Ben Gertzel with artificial intelligence. They're very much of that mindset. So those kind of relationships work. The ones that are impatient, you know, either they'll start, stop, go on another chain, try to work it out there. And at some point in the future, there, there's always a home for them once they've seen that. If you love them, let them go. I mean, and they'll come back. Right? Right. You got it. You got it. That's exactly right. So that's my personal point of view. I think that also reflects the ethos that Charles has tried to create. Um, and I think the long game is the game, right? Where I we're probably, you know, when I first started like four years ago, I, I, I said we're in the 90s of the internet. Yeah. We're probably in the dot com right now. Yeah. 99 From, to 2000. 99 to 2000, exactly. You got it. You got it, right? So um, when did Facebook come out? And I don't want to use them as a good example, but 2004. Well, they right? have 2 billion daily users. Right, it's right. a good example but whether you like them or not. Four years later, right? Yeah. So, I still feel that we're in that kind of time frame, and I think we've got the right finger on the pulse in terms of the innovations, like or the S curve of. Well, um, I find it funny when people critical of the blockchain industry use the dot com bubble as the best corollary for why it's a problem. Right. As if the largest companies and most important and impactful companies in the entire world were not the phoenixes that rose from the ashes of the dot-com bubble. That's exactly right. So. Of course, you if you have a new space and you have innovation and you have every smart entrepreneur coming there, 99% are going to fail, that's but they're right. all going to advance the ball slightly. That's exactly and right. And somebody's going to win. That, that's also a hard thing to explain to people that come from traditional markets. But that's it's, a traditional market. They should get it perfectly. But well, yes. I mean... I agree with you. I mean, yeah, let's call it, call it, you know, what do they call it? The traditional finance, for example, right. is, is the term that... You know, people in the VC world in Silicon Valley, they get it, right? They understand it. They went through that web too. What they don't get is like, they want to capture all the value, right? It's like, what's in it for me, Yeah. right? So educating them about the new model and how, what advantages that brings is a bit of a tough sell. Another big differentiator of Cardano is that there's not many insiders. If you look at the distribution of, of ownership of ADA, it's primarily individuals. There's very little, like very few whales, very few insiders. There was no VCs that took 30, 40, 50% of it. Right. So that's another very different thing, right? Which again, just comes from the mission, vision, and cascades down. The VC's like, well, where's my ROI next year? Sorry, where's my ROI next quarter, right? If it's not there, they'll say, oh, it's a ghost chain, you know, right. complaint. Plus they're also paid off by, you know, our competitors, right? And, the, and they're also incentivized to create that FUD. Um, so I think time will tell. And I think we're taking the right approach. And I think we will be one of the ones that come out the other side of this, including some of the more, you know, right. uh, do things quickly and break fast. Yeah, Ethereum's not going anywhere. Yeah, I agree. Um, I agree. I think you guys have had, for, as an outsider's perspective, a bit of a catch-22, which was that you're playing the long game very vocally, yes. academic perspective, but then the price of the coin reached such a high market cap that it forced expectations that you would be breaking things and moving fast. Absolutely. Uh, that's a very difficult thing 
uh, needle to thread. It's like almost would have been better for you guys if there had been less interest in the coin specifically for that period of time. I know you can't necessarily say that, but... I mean, if you were to ask me, I would prefer less volatility. Yeah. I mean, that's ultimately the goal should be a, an ecosystem that has a real world value that is easy to quantify. We're starting to get there, I think. Um, you know, if you look at a layer one blockchain, it's a block, it's a block producing service. And that's your layer one. And at the beginning, yes, it's bootstrapped by uh, some speculation, some expectation of the future, inflation as well. And then that conversion, what they call the chasm, towards world world utility. You know, and these are, you, you could go to like, you know, models from um, Gartner and BCG and all yeah. these guys. These are vel very well understood models, right? And yeah, personally, I would prefer less volatility. I'm not going to make any speculation of what the value will look like in the future. I'm just saying we're building towards more daily active users, more use and utility, adoption, the real value behind a network. Which yeah, is the, the price platform. of the coin uh, is almost in no way a reflection of the value of the network. I, I think there's noise around I think, it. I don't think specific to you. I mean, right. in this ecosystem sure. right now, I, I, I would argue that the price of Bitcoin is not in line with the value of Bitcoin. Right. Well, it, it always, so here, this is what I find interesting, having been, this, been in this for a while. Everyone tries to use an analogy to describe what we're doing. It's different. It's a different animal, right? It's like a unicorn appeared. Oh, it's like a horse and a rhino, right? Yeah, kind of, but not, right? Um, and I think, you know, the narrative keeps changing and that's what people get confused about. So Bitcoin, the Bitcoin narrative keeps changing, right? At first it was a payment system, right? And then it's a store of value, it's like gold. Well, it's, it's this, and it's that, and it's that, and it's this, and it's a little bit of everything. And it hasn't found its evolutionary need yet, right, perfectly. It's got some pieces of it. And when it happens, be, of course that's what it was, right? But this is where I think a lot of the noise, it's important that people understand there's a lot of noise in the system right now, which kind of fluctuates the, the perceived value of things versus what the real value is. A lot of it right now is future looking, right? You know, if, it, if Bitcoin becomes a unit of accounts and replaces all currencies, then it's far more valuable than it is today. If it's just a replacement for gold, it's still far more valuable. If it's something else... It might still be far more valuable. Right, you don't know, right? Yeah. You know, let it go through. The macro environment right now is gonna depress yeah, yeah, risk yeah, assets. Yeah, right, I mean, you can't so, figure out Right. You can't differentiate anything from anything else exactly. in, the, in the environment where liquidity is being sucked out of the right. system. And it's a good thing, though, because that, you know, the real projects survive. The phoenixes will rise the from the ashes. It's the same the sort of... It's an evolutionary pressure. It's like the asteroid hit the Earth and the dinosaurs died and, you know, mammals grew and humanity comes out of it. So, so how do you separate the signal from the noise in an environment like ten, this, ten, especially... I like to use the word 10,000 hours, right? Time. You have to study it. Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm right. Gladwell, right? Of I, I'm a firm believer in that because I went through this. I didn't know what a blockchain was when I started. I thought it was this. And the more I learned about it, well, no, it's not that. And I'm still learning. I think you need to put the 10,000 hours in to truly understand it. And as a commercial guy, part of my job is to try to simplify that as best that I can to explain it better. But if you're really going to put any significant investment in this, you should be invested in it because you believe in the technology, you believe in what we're doing, the communities that are being created, not for some return on investment. Again, not a financial advice, but yeah. you get what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And if you're in it because it's FOMO and your friends are in it, don't be in it, right? right? Or be just know, what, know why you're in it exactly. and accept it. Accept it. Know accept that you're yourself. gambling that's right. and that you're not getting the free drinks at the casino. Exactly. You got it. Absolutely. So that's, that's the way I look at it. I see this as being game changing. I was at the blockchain event in Paris. And there was a, a historian of money that spoke about the innovations from antiquity. And he put blockchain in that context. It really is, in my personal opinion, of the order of magnitude of the creation of, of money, of the creation of the corporation, of the creation of government systems. It's at that level, in my personal point of view. That is a hard thing to wrap your mind around. And you also have the established powers that see this and are pushing against it because they see that it could disrupt the IMF. It could disrupt centralized governance. They don't like that. They don't like it. You can see, they especially like the it. IMF, 
You, so, you mentioned Bitcoin or uh, cryptocurrency in any uh, country around the world, and the IMF all of a sudden I'm, steps in I'm with their uh, threats about not offering any more loans. Or in the in the Argentina was ready in the clause in the clause yeah. to lend the money. Don't don't yeah. have Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, excuse me. Right? It's your Bitcoin or your ten bill. Right? That's right. <laughs> exactly. And it's like I think the average. But that should show you how actually impactful this right. technology an asset class potentially can yeah. be if they fear it that much. So, because if it was a non-issue, right. yeah. they would still be in the ignore you phase. Exactly. And it's, they're not, they're exactly. in the fight you phase. So I'm in this industry because I believe in it. I believe it's civilization altering technology. That's what I personally believe. I didn't believe that when I started, but the more and more I'm in it, that's what I believe. So- It's a deep rabbit hole. It's a very deep rabbit hole, absolutely. and. That's my personal belief. The DAOs that are there, new ways of, new ways of doing incorporation, new ways of organizing people. Um, if you look at all of the users in our space, what are we, 100 million, 200 million, something like that? I would argue a lot smaller. Maybe 50 million? No, I know, but I, you are correct, but I love how we lump in like every person who's ever bought a right, coin sure. ever as part of our ecosystem, but sure. we know that the majority of them are speculators who bought a dog. Sure. I, I agree. So, yeah. so, so I think we're even smaller than we're given uh, credit for. It. Pick a number: fifty right. million, sure, thirty million. That's the size of the New York City, right. right? So, what about people all around the planet who are working together to change the world, and it's got the population of New York City? Yeah. And at one point, it's how the population of New York State, then the population of the United States, and then the population, you know, uh, it'll be bigger than a nation. Right. But nothing that we have right now can operate at that scale. No, I agree. Yeah. And th there's other parts of it too that I think some people uh, forget is that the base layer is still the internet. Of course. And yeah, we love to talk about decentralization, but when Amazon Web Services or Cloudflare goes down, we realize right. very quickly how uh, centralized we are. Yeah, and you know, not to knock Ethereum, but um, you know, Infura and MetaMask, you know, they're choke points now, right? They could shut things down. Sure. And there's choke points. I mean, the Tornado Cash. I mean, Tornado the cash. best example. Example. And that's a great example, right? But somewhere in the wings, there's waiting a new version of the internet below it that will be scalable and so forth. Compute power, keep, although Moore's Law has lost some of its steam, it's still very much alive. So once that layer also expands and the scalability will increase, all the innovation in the space, they'll fix that problem. Not all of it needs to be done on layer one. They're very, they're very compelling layer two, uh, you know, the roll-ups and all that kind of stuff that are filling in the gap. Sure. So I'm very optimistic, but you're right, it's probably, again, to anyone's guess, who can guess an exponential curve, right? Right, the but when you talk about, hey, we're at 50 million yeah. and breaking things, yeah. a billion starts to become very daunting. I agree. Three billion even, way more daunting. I, I agree. So there, there is a space there to, for the innovation to come in. And also, to be fair, allowing the governments to get into it in a positive manner. Of course. Allowing the institutions to get in a positive matter, where, you know, I'm not a fan of a lot of regulation, but some of it's there for a good reason and purpose. People do need protection. Prote consumer protection. How do you protect the consumer in a decentralized way? That's super important. We shouldn't throw the baby out with the dirty bathwater. No. And I also look at it a bit like a living system, right? So the human body is a decentralized system, but has a lot of centralized functions to it. The problem I see is that currently, especially in, in, in Western societies, there's too much centralization. So now the decentralized movement's coming in. I think a good balance between the two is probably where we'll end up being. How, how dare you not say we need to be fully centralized yeah. or fully decentralized and admit that maybe it's a sliding scale. That's right, yeah. So, and I like that competition, right? The competition is the way things are gonna get better. Uh, and I'll take Cardano for example. We had a, an interview, they're like, when are we gonna change the world? And I'm like, well, haven't we kind of started you know, we built a, an ecosystem that has millions of people in the community, thousands of stake pool operators, a thousand dApps looking to develop, a few hundred coming out over the next few years, employment of thousands of people, that's something, right? When you talk about the long game then, what is that timeline? I mean, that's probably what people ask you the most, right? It's, it's, we're on an exponential curve, it's anyone's guess. I mean, my gut- But you guys are not in a rush. Right, my, my you know, I've been in this in five years, four or five years. I don't recognize what I see now versus where I started. Crazy. So, and that five years should be like that same exponential growth is probably yeah. one year now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you got it, right. Yeah. So. And then six months and then three, right. You know what, I'll say a generation. 
because it's not just about the technology, it's about the people. Well, all, all the, I hate to say it, but the people in control have to right. be removed, which right. generally these days means die. Yes, exactly. And the younger generation that gets it needs to replace them. So I think, And you can't force that. I agree. I think the technology will get there before the mentality and the governance structure adapts. So I think it's a generational shift. That's, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just throw that out there. Because millennials, Gen Zs, I'm a Gen Xer, kind of a bridge, a bridge. 45 years old. Yeah, 48. We're the bridging generation, right? We built all this stuff, but remember what it was like before the internet, right? Well, I showed up at the University of Pennsylvania in 1995 for my freshman year and they said, what do you want your email address to be? And I said, what the hell is an email yeah, exactly. address? <laughs> and, and I remember when we first- I had used LexisNexis before yeah, yeah. at the library, public library. And I remember the internet, I was in university when the internet started, and Mosaic was the, I think it was Mosaic at the time. And the first thing I did was download a picture of Bugs Bunny. Yeah. That was the internet to me. Mine was Cindy Crawford. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but, I had to, but I it took a day. You know, it was like uh, watching a dot matrix printer on your screen just to get one photo. So what was it to me? It was like, oh my God, all that stuff that I used to have to wait to watch, I could not have access to. So my first gut was nostalgia. And this is when it was a passive just, you know, thing. Information, right. Yeah, and then we, we've been part of this revolution, so we've seen how quickly it could, it could move. I mean, I remember as a kid having the phone, the fixed line with the big cord, right? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. And then the and if, anybody has, before the, if anybody has zero in the number, uh, big problem, right? Yeah, huge. <laughs> you know, I think we're kind of the bridging generation that help kind of bring it to that level, but I think the millennials, the Gen Zers, or whatever the next generations are going to be called, they need to come into power for this technology to really, to really. Well, I think that crypto might still be the in the rotary phone phase, but I look forward to us getting to uh, the iPhone. Yeah, exactly. So how long will that be? I think a generation, but with a lot of leaps and bounds, probably in a five-year cycle. And are you guys willing to wait that out of and continue yes. to develop slowly and methodically? Hundred percent. Regardless of how much criticism you get for it. Hundred percent. I mean, you spoke to Charles, right? Yeah, and then I started the entire interview with an apology. But yes, I have, and and then the the rest of it went on to a conversation about tribalism. Not an apology for anything I said, right? But an apology for what people have said who have come into my interviews. So that was a big cultural change for me because I came from, I worked at Dell before coming into the block. A little different. Space. Yeah, for sure. Although Michael Dell is a very is an extraordinary man himself in his own right, in his own in his own. He disrupted the industry back in his day, right? I was used to quarterly cadence, right? Months, quarters are very important. And then working for Charles, he's looking at things. This is his life work. This is, you know, this is whatever the fifth symphony, right? This is, this is his life work. He's not going anywhere. He's a young guy. He's in it for the long game. And that took an adjustment for me. But, you know, I'm in it too because of just the magnitude of what we're trying to do here. Well, it's, a, it's a amazing to hear it articulated because, as you said, there's so much noise. Yeah, and I'm the commercial guy, right? So I'm like, I'm trying to prime the pump. And when I first got in, kind of the, because there was a lot of nervousness in my company when I came in, why are you getting commercial guy? You know, we're not about making money. We're about changing the world. Well, you can't change the world without uh, people knowing about you. That's right. <laughs> so that was kind of what I said, the, 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 the dog wagging the tail, right? I'm here to support the mission and vision. But in, in the meantime, to get that cascading disruption, you need to make profitable businesses that can do that because that's the only way to do it. It's not just about giving grants to people and continually doing that. That's not a sustainable model. So for me, commercialization, utility adoption, creating viable businesses out of it is what's going to create the cascading disruption. Uh, uh, all streets, you know, Wall, Wall Street, Main Street, you need both, right? So. Well, sounds like you believe we can get there, and yes. I, I share that belief. So I, I, it's nice to hear uh, the vision and to know that it's purposeful. Yes. Because if you listen to Twitter, you would think it's just like nobody's working. Right. Well, we, we're about 500 people in, the, in, a, in IOG, right? and that's just IOG. We're thousands of people in the ecosystem building right now. That's the order of magnitude of what's being built um, in Cardano. And then as you multiply across the industry, you're in the tens of thousands. It's quite impactful. Well, can't wait to see it all come to fruition. Awesome. Thank you so much. My Jeff. pleasure. Really so where, where, where do we hit the bell, subscribe? Do we do it yeah, exactly? hit the button, subscribe to the thing, the button, do the stuff, yeah, like the friends, the stuff, like the friends, see the guy. That's right. <laughs>